Hey, everybody. Welcome. Welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining Blue Jeans and a terrific group of video luminaries and visionaries to talk about video meeting people where they work. With me, we've got Eugene Lee, VP of Tech Strategy for Viacom. Eugene? Hey, Mike. How are you? I'm great. Thanks a million for joining us. Of course. Jim Mueller, Head of IT for ADP. Hi, Mike. How are you? Great to see you, Jim. Thanks for joining us. Craig Williams, Head of IT for LinkedIn. Hey, Mike. Hi, everyone. There he is. Craig, great to see you. And we've got Elizabeth Chalowski, who is hey, CEO Mike. of support.com. There she is, Elizabeth. Hey, it's so good to see you again. Good to see you. We've got, and it looks like we've got Steven Soderberg. Steven, thank you. I know your schedule is crazy right now. Thank you for joining us, VP of IT of Fitbit. Steven? Fantastic to see you. So guys, what we want to do today is we want to share with you the points of view of a set of people who were early adopters to video, a set of people who have carried their organizations into cultures of video, and a group of people who understand how to unlock the power of putting people at the center of communications. So let's just start. Let's just roll. And maybe what we'll do is, Eugene, let's start with you. You've Tell us first a little bit about Viacom, and, and then maybe you could talk a little bit about the opportunity for video that you saw, why you stepped into video. Sure. So Viacom's a media company. I think we're most uh, known for our brands, uh, Paramount Pictures, MTV, Nickelodeon, and BET are some of our more notable brands. Um, as far as an opportunity, um, I think the biggest opportunity was fulfilling an unfilled promise. Um, I think with video over the past decade, there's been you know, quite a big a lot of people have been talking about video and how it could be transformational, but it hasn't really fulfilled that promise. Um, for me, I think the only truly successful video play that we saw that was just a slam dunk home run was, you know, those very large and expensive telepresence rooms. But the problem with those rooms is, A, they're very expensive, a few hundred thousand dollars each. And in addition to that, you know, if you're lucky to have any in your organization, you only had a handful. So it wasn't really something ubiquitous that everybody could use. Um, so for me, the opportunity was really to take video and democratize it across the organization. And to do that, a few things we had to do. Number one was simplify our conference rooms. Our conference rooms were way too complex. Um, the cost of doing video, whether it's the resources required to set up the video call or the um, you know, complexity or, or just the fear that people had of walking into a conference room and using those complex control systems to connect their own calls was just too much of a burden. And so there was a cost to getting video going. So for us, we needed to simplify the conference rooms, and we did that. And the goal there was to basically have a goal of, you know, 80-20 rule. 80% 80 of the calls that you do, or I'm sorry, 80% of the meetings that you do, if I can have any user walk in and use our new standardized rooms, and they can do one of three things, which is either, you know, take your laptop display, put it on the screen, make an audio call if you're making an audio call, or make a video call. All those three things we just needed to make real simple across the board. And so we did that with the simplified conference room. The next step was to really make it so that you could video conference from anywhere, any device. Um, because you know, every conference room, I don't know about the other organizations, but not every conference room at Viacom is video conference enabled, be it cost or whatnot, just a sheer number of rooms. And so once again, to democratize and make sure that everyone has access to it, to make it ubiquitous, we needed to make sure that people could do it from anywhere, not only when they could schedule a room that had video conference enabled. So, uh, for us, using something like Blue Jeans was really able to get people, whether on an iPhone, an iPad, laptop, to be able to join a video conference. Uh, that was key for us in getting um, you know, video out there to the masses. And then once you do that, you know, you start to see video culture. People start to adopt it more. People start getting used to seeing people on video. And then once you're actually doing a majority of your calls using video, you start to, when you join just an audio call, you start to realize it's not as compelling anymore. And you see great sure. silhouettes or you're just hearing voices coming out of the ceiling. It's not as engaging, and so once you know, it's kind of like snowball that starts to gain momentum, and then the culture begins to just accept video a lot more. Yeah, it just feels weird, right? Because you and I, you, you we can do this right now, and we'll step out of this as if we had a person-to-person -person conversation, and this alone doesn't work. So that's yeah, really no, good. You know, I, I think that I think that people come from one of three places when they think of video today. They they come from, hey, I've got this great conference room with all this cool equipment. The advantage is it's perfect. The disadvantage is I have to go to it, and not everybody works in conference rooms. The right. second is 
kind of this notion of web conferencing, which is great because you can carry it anywhere. The challenge is you've got limited video and you kind of have a walled garden, and then you've got personal video. You've got the stuff you do at home, which is super cool and doesn't really scale. So bringing all of that together, bringing it together to make video ubiquitous so you can experience that, that experience you love. You, you want to have a video experience that you love as an end user, and you want to have it at scale. And that sounds a no, lot for like- sure. I mean, you touched on it. I think you kind of touched on it with the uh, like the web conferencing. You know, there are a lot of technologies out there that have video, but video is not a video first product. And so in our organization, when you when you get scheduled for a blue jeans call, the expectation is you're going to show up on video. And I'm kind of disappointed when they don't, if people just call in on their phone or something, it's a little disappointing. If I'm familiar enough with them, I'll call them out on it, you know, try and entice them to turn on their video. But the other right. products, you know, it's it's, it's web conferencing first, and then if you want, you can turn on your video. And once again, if you, you've been on those calls, nobody ever enables their video on those calls because it's just not what the product was intended for. So a video first product uh, definitely helps with that culture as well. I, I couldn't agree more. Thanks, Eugene. Uh, Jim, maybe we turn a little bit to ADP. Uh, maybe you can spend a, spend a moment or two talking about ADP, what it's like today, and what's been the impact of video comms for you? Sure. Uh, for people that don't know, uh, ADP is a comprehensive global provider of cloud-based human capital management solutions. So most people know it's for payroll, but uh, you know we also unite HR, talent, time, tax, benefits administration, and we're also a leader in business outsourcing services, analytics, and compliance expertise. So we have all gamut. That's so uh, when it comes to it comes to video, right? So for us, it was really you know looking for a broad a broad solution to, to kind of fit our needs, right? So we're, we're, we were kind of, you know, the way we needed it is we needed something that could, that could also fit, you know, the, the traditional conference rooms, but also could go all the way out to the sales organizations, support for mobile devices. So kind of how we use video at ADP is, you know, really, you know, connecting remote remote capabilities, remote, remote users, you know, whether it's with clients or even interviews or, you know, internal meetings, you know, I myself use video um, and all my staff and remote users as well. Right, so that's really where it started to change the kind of the mindset and the culture where, you know, we still have places where office layouts and just preferences or whatever it may be, you know, people still gather in conference rooms, but then we can support also, you know, uh, connecting via, via desktops, uh, you know, the browser-based, uh, you know, uh, ability is, 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 is key, especially when we're on a road, that kind of stuff. So that's really how it's starting to change the dynamic at ADP. We're just being able to right. use it to connect remote, remotely and, 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 you know, see body language, get familiarity, right, you know, some of the other spaces. We, yeah, exactly. Here we are. Where we see it is also um, in, in, in spaces where we're trying to collaborate with remote workers where maybe not everyone can travel, right? You know, that that's something where video is, is, is really helping us out that you can actually get a sense of what's going on in the room so you don't have people kind of stuck on the audio bridge with not knowing if the room just emptied out and, you know, who's in there or, you know, if people are kind of trying to explain concepts. You know, they can kind of put names and faces and understand the dynamic of the room, whether someone really agrees with it or they're just kind of hearing you know, uh, something that, that you can see by the body language, maybe not everyone's on board with. So it, it really helps, you know, videos really helped us provide a lot more richer uh, experiences, um, as well as also, you know, for just communication in general, right? You know, uh, folks that want to have a... So thank you very much. And, you know, I'd love, I'd love to travel to Craig. Craig, if, you, if we've got you, I'd love to chat with you a bit about the video experience at LinkedIn. Uh, I am often... Uh, wandering the halls of LinkedIn, and I see people on mobile devices actually looking at their videos all all day long. It's an extraordinary culture. Um, tell me a little bit about about you know, what's transpired at LinkedIn. What drove you yeah, to video? Yeah. Uh, um, so about two, maybe three years ago, we were really going through hyper growth, and you know the culture, as you mentioned, is very strong at LinkedIn, and that's something we can't afford to give up. And when you're growing um, as fast as we were growing, um, we had to figure out a way to keep the culture. And um, so what we did was um, as we moved out of Mountain View, because we were mostly all in Mountain View at one time, and then all of a sudden we're everywhere across the world. And one thing we just had to do is we had to do every, uh, make every conference room video enabled, every device video enabled, and through Blue Jeans. I think you, you mentioned it, Mike. We had to do it in kind of an unthinking way. Um, and that was so important for us because um, we don't want people to be thinking about VC. We want them to be thinking about their job and how to make money for the company and do what they are hired to do. And so with that, with you guys' partnership, um, last year we saw over 2,000% growth in VC minutes um, alone just because of what you guys were able to do. And it's the speed and the quality that has been so important 
um, for uh, for us and the partnership we've had with you. Yeah, thanks. I mean, you, you guys really are a phenomenon. I, I, you know, it's it's hard to describe what 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 entering into a video culture looks like until you enter a video culture and you literally see people who, when when many people would normally be having a conversation like this, they are not. They're having a conversation with a headset, looking at their iPhones, sitting at lunch in your beautiful right. cafeteria. I mean, that's just a remarkable thing, and you just watch it. You watch it unlock people. That's yep. fantastic. Yep. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I want to make sure that we get to every one of you in the time that we have right now. I, I also want to flip to a video that we did a little bit earlier with a couple of guys who are seriously passionate about video as well. Um, one of them, uh, one of the many of you know, his name is Derek Jeter. Uh, he is a fan of video. He is an early adopter of video. He's a guy who uses video as part of Players Tribune and connecting fans with athletes in a way that is unparalleled, really connecting people to people in a way that unleashes the power of players with their fans around the world. The second person that we're gonna hear from, um, Dan Alleg is the CIO of perhaps the most important business school in the world, the Wharton Business School. Let's roll video and see what Derek and Dan have to say about their use of video. Derek, it's just great to see you. Uh, welcome, uh, welcome aboard, and tell us a bit about the Players Tribune. Mike, the Tribune is a uh, video platform media company that I started roughly about a year and a half ago. And, and uh, what we wanted to do was to develop a platform for athletes so that they could share their stories and share their news in an unfiltered, unbiased way. And uh, on top of just giving them that platform, we wanted to equip them with the tools to do it in a high quality manner. And we're doing that through photography or with our writers and our editors and video as well. And what was the basis for returning to video? Kind of how were you thinking about, about video in the first place? For us, we think, you know, video is very powerful. And, and for us as a company, our focus moving forward is on our video strategy. And for us, we feel as though video is, feels more personal and more of our, most of our more popular pieces have been our video content. Yeah, I bet. Uh, tell me a little bit about how, how video has, um, I guess, personalized the way that athletes connect uh, with their fans. That's the yeah, basis, well, live, right? Yeah, live video especially. You know, we feel as though live video is immersive, you know, brings fans closer. Um, you know, you get an opportunity to look fans in the eyes and, and really create a connection. Uh, you know, we were fortunate to have our first live video chat on Blue Jeans with, with David Ortiz right after he announced his retirement. And, you know, the engagement that we had with the fans was great. Yeah, I agree. You said something earlier that I thought was interesting. You used the word um, immersive. And I agree. It is, this is immersive. What we are doing is immersive. And I think at, at you know yet one more level and what you're describing it's intimate, right? And that's what you that's what you've enabled your players to do with their fans. People walk away with a visceral feeling. Uh, it's no longer an abstraction. I mean, it is a feeling. It's, it's the real deal. Fan interaction. It's just like you know watching a sporting event on television as opposed to being there in person. Yeah, it's great to see it on TV, but you want to actually experience it and get the opportunity. If you don't actually have the opportunity to interact with maybe your favorite athletes in person. This is as close as it gets and it, it makes it uh, it makes it exciting for them. It makes it exciting for the fan I mean for the players as well because they're really into um, you know speaking to their fans and sharing a lot of things with them nowadays. Well I am sure Derek that uh, there are many people who will watch this um, and be thrilled by the opportunity to have this experience with you. So again thank you for Thank you for taking the time to spend with us, uh, uh, with us around the world, uh, and, and sharing what Players Review is doing. It's great. Well, thanks for having me, Dan. It's uh, it's so great to see. It's great to see you. Thank you for joining us today. Yeah, my pleasure. Always great to talk to you, Mike. Tell me, tell me a little bit about what you do at Wharton, uh, and about about really your mission and vision for for video at Wharton. So at Wharton, you know. It's pretty simple. We're one of the, the oldest, we're the oldest business school in the, the world. And our mission is fairly straightforward. It's to create business knowledge and then disseminate it across the globe. And that's changed a lot in the 130 years of our history. Um, not so much internet back then, but you know, today video is integral to what we do. Um, you know, we, it's about bringing knowledge onto campus 
and it's about connecting people where they are, wherever they are. And a video and, and interaction is so important to that mission. Well, you know, we, we, we think of video interaction, um, you, you kind of intuitively understand the, the professor to student relationship in video. Is that where primarily Wharton uses video? Are there other use cases for you? No, that's really just scraping the, the tip of the iceberg there. You know, it's really, you know, knowledge, especially business knowledge, is being created every day all over the globe. And the conversation is just between the faculty member and the student. You know, the new textbook is the world. And we're bringing knowledge experts in from wherever they are around the globe. You know, they could be in the back of their limousine lecturing to our students from Wall Street, or they could be in Abu Dhabi on their way to an important event. And it really doesn't matter where they are in the world, they can connect to the classroom from wherever they are, whether a conference room, whether their car, whether an airplane even, we've had somebody dial in from the tarmac. So it's, you know, it's really about connecting the people who are experiencing business with our students who are learning about it. And Derek Jeter, uh, those are, you know, great contemporaries who also believe in fully and embrace video. Um, thanks much. Let's. Let's now turn to a couple more questions for our panelists. Maybe Elizabeth, why don't we start with you? Uh, you know, tell us a little bit about support.com and tell us about your experience in, in entering video and kind of how you think about it. Yeah, yeah. So um, support.com is a product and services company where we're focused on making technology do what it's supposed to do. So we do that in two ways. We have um, our cloud product, which helps companies resolve technical, complex technical support problems. And then we also have a number of agents, um, close to 2,000 out in the field, that help companies resolve their technical support problems. So they handle thousands and thousands of interactions each day with complex technical support. Um, what you know is we're a highly distributed company. So those um, close to, to 2,000 agents out in the field are all home-based agents in North America. So we pioneered that model for the contact center. And so it's critically important for the company since we're so distrib distributed. And it's not just the agents, only a third of our corporate employees work in Redwood City. Um, the rest are spread out over North America and Bangalore. Critically important that yeah. we have video to build a great company. So that's really important to me and to the company. And you know, one of the questions that we get um, it, as video becomes more and more prevalent, there's this notion of an elephant in the room, which is if people don't feel comfortable in video, how do, you, how do you make people comfortable? How do you get people who are wearing baseball caps realize that it's okay to wear a baseball cap because you get to bring your whole self to work and do your job? How have you worked through that? Yeah, yeah. well, some of the agents out in the field, they, they don't really care that they're wearing baseball caps or, or their favorite uh, death metal T-shirt, so that's just fine. But, um, but it really is both a top <laughs> tops down and bottoms up approach to, to getting that going. Um, when I first got here, actually, we didn't have any room systems fitted out. And it really made everybody in the field a second class citizen. So we'd ask them to turn on their webcams and then we'd have these like, dinky little things trying to get a whole room of people. So the first thing I had to do is kind of, kind of give an egalitarian approach to it. We had to get a room system so that people in the field could see who was here as well as we could see those on their individual cameras. And of course, blue jeans helped us tremendously with that. But now we're building this culture that if you're not on video, you're just not in the meeting. So, and people have kind of gotten that, that it's really hard to interact if you're just on the phone, but if you're on video and you can wave your hand, um, it's a big I'm difference. Here. I'm here, I wanna talk. Um, so it's, it's working and I see, yeah. it, see it going across the company. Thank you. Awesome. And and Steve, um, Fitbit. Wow. You know, I don't have my Fitbit device on right now. I got to tell you that my wife and uh, my mother have a very healthy competition with their Fitbits right now, and they're counting steps left, right, and center. And it's it's not always great for me, but we love Fitbit. Uh, tell me a little bit about blue jeans. Tell me a little bit about about, about Fitbit and uh, and video um, before I get myself in more trouble well, with my family. <laughs> So Fitbit is is right in the teeth of a hyper growth stage right now. Um, you know, seven years ago, the entire company was two guys. You know, Eric and James, the two founders. And yeah. you know, we're coming up on two thousand 
employees now. And, you know, a huge amount of what I'm trying to do specifically with video is use video, not so much for the technology aspect, but as a culture bridge. Uh, you know, last year we were sitting, you know, primarily in San Francisco, you know, we had three floors and two buildings and it wasn't that hard to get everybody together so the founders could talk to them and actually, instead of being managers, be leaders and, and provide that emotional tie back to the founding of the company. As the company grew, you know, here we are a year later and we're on 15 floors and nine different buildings and multiple cities. And, and the, the founders were really losing that ability to, to touch employees and, and motivate employees. So, you know, effectively what, what we're doing is using video to provide that, that all hands bridge so the founders can, can effectively take our, our little 300 person conference room here that we use for local all hands meetings and kind of virtually flood in a couple thousand people into that room. Yeah, I love that. The notion of a virtual room, several thousand people large. Um, you, you touched on something that's super important, and, and I don't know how to emphasize it enough. It's this notion of culture, a culture of communication. Essentially, what we're all doing, the, the, you know, the common denominator in all of our stories, um, including Dan's and Derek's, is, is putting people at the center of the conversation. And we, again, and that requires that we make it very, very easy for people to experience video. It makes, we have to, it's on us to create video experiences that people love. That's our goal. That's our job. So it's awesome. Um, you, you guys have done such a great job. Uh, you know, I'd like to see if there, we have any questions from, from any of our audience that would like to pipe in. Um, it looks like we've got, well, it looks like we've got several questions. Uh, why don't I just pick one off the top here? Uh, Jim, uh, Jim Morandi from AT&T, um, is there a comment or a question that you'd like to ask? Uh, yeah, great. So thanks for, for doing this. This is a great presentation. I'd like to thank the panelists as well for participating. You guys, this is great insight. Really appreciate it. And my question is, we've talked a lot about um, internal benefits and internal use cases. And I'm just curious, you know, beyond simply having a conversation, uh, how has video communication made it for other companies to work with you? What are you hearing from your partners and suppliers or your customers? Oh, that's an interesting question. Uh, Eugene or Craig or Elizabeth or James, does, does one of you want to tackle that? So I'll, let, let me just go tackle it from one angle of um, of the support experience. So as I said, we use, we use video with our agents out in the field all the time. The next step, and, and I'm just waiting for that sea change where everybody is really accepting so that we can use it in the support experience. But what's happened over time is we teach empathy through video. And that's hugely important in the support experience. And the customers are getting the benefit of that because the NPS scores that we have across the board are now higher than other, other vendors that supply our suppliers and higher than industry standards. And I do attribute that to how we individually can reach out a work from home agent through video and the customers are seeing and commenting on the impact of that. Thank you, it's really good. And it looks like we've got another question um, uh, from David Maldo. What, David, do you, do you, uh, you can read the question, you don't need me to. Oh, sure, uh, thanks for having me here today. This is, um, by the way, great event, really, uh, really insightful. And uh, my question is about adoptability by the workforce. Um, I've been covering this space for a while, and in the previous generation of video conferencing, when cameras were locked into meeting rooms, we thought it would be self-adopting because the value was there. But like Mike said earlier, no one wanted to get up from their desk and walk down the hall to use the video. So today it's, it's obviously very different. It's, it's mobile, it's desktop, it's cloud, it's flexible, it's easy. So my question is, are we there? Is it now self-adopting? And if it's not self-adopting, what barriers are you seeing and how are you overcoming those barriers? And what kind of guitar is that behind you? Who wants to tackle that question? <laughs> TV predator. Yeah, I'll, I'll take that one. So yeah, as far as video goes, um, I, I totally agree. Um, like I said earlier as well, once we made it not anchored into a conference room, it really made it a lot more accessible for our users. Uh, once again, whether you have the issue of just conference rooms are impossible to book or not every conference room having video uh, enabled, uh, just being able for people to connect from anywhere. Another benefit is, you know, we used to, uh, back in the old days, uh, before using Blue Jeans, when we were using our standard uh, bridges, what would happen is if it was a point-to-point -point call, it would be from conference room X to conference room Y. 
And then what would happen is the executive would end up not being able to make it to that room or something. And last minute, we'd have to scull around and, and try and figure out you know, how to change it so that they could log in from home or move it to a different bridge so that we could have three or four more participants. The beauty of the ubiquity is that you schedule it, it's on the bridge, and whether you're in the office, whether you're in a conference room as scheduled, or whether you had to stay home with the kids that day, you just jump on your kid's iMac and open up your browser and you're still able to join the call. That type of um, ability to connect from anywhere really, uh, once people experience that, it just kind of really lowers that barrier and adds ease of use. So once, once you get ease of use, and then over time, people will just begin to expect video more. So it's not something you instill into your organization overnight, but as more and more people experience it and become more comfortable with it, get over some of the hangups about turning on your video, you really start to see a snowball effect. Our video usage, our minutes on BlueJeans is, you know, it's, it's a quite, quite a big growth curve in the number of minutes. We're, we're over a few million minutes already this year. I just thank you, Eugene, and, just, and, and, and for the question as well. There's just nothing like, there's just nothing like live video. There's the, even even with the mistakes that are made, even with the quirky stuff that happens because your hair isn't your hair isn't right, or because you forget that you're on a camera for a second, it creates a level of intimacy that you cannot ever achieve without it. And I think the industry is finally here. And I think the two things that I'm hearing from all of you, the combination is, you you all had vision, and you all had what I'll broadly call a platform for video, and you're all delivering end user experiences that people love, that people genuinely love, and that's what welcomes people in. And, and with that, what I would like to do is I would like to welcome Krish Ramakrishnan, the CEO and founder of Blue Jeans. Krish, welcome. Thank you, Mike. Great job. Thank you, guys. Awesome panel. Uh, six years ago, we started this company. Um, with the sole purpose of making video accessible from every device. And largely because of innovation, interop is a reality today. We're also witnessing something unique. We are in the midst of a video revolution. Just watch uh, Facebook uh, Live last week, launch of it. Great, and there are many such events. Panelists, uh, thank you for the great insight into the work culture, how videos impacted that. And I want to also thank our customers and uh, partners and all the end, end users around the world. Thanks for sharing the journey with us. Uh, this is start of a new phase for Blue Jeans, making video part of everyday life. So won't you join us on this great journey? It begins now. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.